The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Friday, July 18th, 2014. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker, Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Friday Night Question and Answer Program. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the Bible with any questions or comments that you may have, and each person is invited to share whatever is on your mind by contacting us. In one of the ways that were mentioned, we'll be glad to take your call, and I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible, as the Bible is God's Word. Well, we only have a short time together, so we're going to begin by going to the first person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, Chris. Could you please uh, read from John chapter 21, uh, verse 7? Thank you. John 21, verse 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. I, I know that in this historical parable there is a tremendous amount of spiritual meaning, but I've always not understood about when Simon Peter hears that it's the Lord, uh, what it signifies with the fact that he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and cast himself into the sea. If you could help me with that. Well, I would like to, but I don't think I'm going to be able to. Um, <laughs> I, I've wondered the same thing. We, we know that um, what comes next uh, in verses 8 through 11 is that they have a great catch of fish right and and then they drag it to land to Christ and this pictures the the great multitude that come in out of the great tribulation period um, so why was Peter naked we we know that nakedness in the Bible typifies um, uh, sinfulness where our sins are open before God there, there was an occasion uh, when Christ went to the cross and, in a sense, um, our head was removed from us uh, because Jesus was experiencing the wrath of God in demonstrating the things he had done from the foundation of the world. And, and so one of the disciples fled, and I think someone grabbed... Um, his, the linen. his yes the his linen, linen cloth, cloth yes. and he was naked and we can understand that because again it, it was as though god the lord jesus our covering was taken for us from us temporarily as he went to the cross and and so this left the uh, the disciples um bare in a sense uh, until jesus uh, was able to to finish the, the work that he came to do but here um, the the setting would be since they're about to go fishing at the direction of the Lord Jesus the it, it could be uh, because they've already been fishing and have caught nothing that this somehow relates to the first part of the great tribulation period and and God the Lord Jesus did depart from the church and he had not yet begun his program of evangelizing the world through the latter rain um, which the great catch of fish the 153 fish points to the great multitude saved out of the great tribulation and and so it could relate 
to that um, 2300 evening morning period of time where Christ wasn't in the church and, and God wasn't um, um, sending forth the gospel to save uh, in, in any um, program yet as he would during the, the latter reign. And in a sense, it's almost as if he, uh, the Lord had left the earth as Christ left the disciples um, early on at, at, during that, that period when he went to the cross. It's possible, but I, I, don't, I don't feel very confident about that. Well, thank you, Chris. I, I really appreciate it because I've always, I don't under, really understand it completely, but that was very helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for calling and sharing that verse and your question. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good evening, Chris. Um, the study of tonight uh, answered the questions that I had uh, prepared uh, for the Q&A of this evening. But I have uh, some other questions kind of related to that. Um, Exodus 33, uh, 9 and 10, uh, during the um, meeting of Moses uh, with God in the tent of meeting, and uh, reading also um, uh, Luke 9, 27, from 27 to 36, I'm just giving you some, some verses and to ask the question, the, the long verses. And um, uh, in the stoning of uh, Stephen in, in the book of Acts, the, uh, these are all, uh, Moses and Stephen are all uh, true uh, believers, so saved people, and, and also uh, in the uh, Mount of Transfiguration in the um, Gospel of Luke. It, my question is this, can the expectation of a visible um, a return of Christ just before the very end be granted only to the true believer. Uh, I know it's a spiritual uh, for the rest of the world, I would say, but and also for us, I would say. But I was reading through this here and uh, these verses, and and I had the question: Could this expectation be seen visibly? Only by the true believers, because we really do believe with the uh, with the uh, um, spiritual eyes. But also, uh, can this be possible for us only? Um, let me let me make sure I understand your question. You're you're referring to the coming of Christ at the end of the world, right. and are you saying will true believers see that by faith? By faith, yes, we would see it, but uh, uh, that, that I firmly believe in that. Uh, uh, but as I was uh, going through these uh, uh, verses that I mentioned, as I said, in Exodus, Acts, and in Luke, uh, these were physical events which the true believers of those days, Moses and, and Stephens and, and the apostles, the other two apostles on the Mount of Transfiguration, they really did see with their physical eyes. So I was thinking, is there a possibility or an expectation that we would see that just before me at the very last moment? Oh, uh, or it I, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I, we we see right now. Uh, we see, for instance, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, and if um, we would ask a, a bunch of people who are true believers. If we knew a bunch of people who were true believers, do you see that? Yes, I see that. And that's what God says in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then flee to the mountains. That That's the stimulus to get out of the church. And yet we don't see it with our, our physical eyes. And, and that's the same thing. When we're seeing the sign of the Son of Man now in, in the heavens, the sign is the absence of the gospel light. Uh, as it says in Matthew 24, 
verse 29 says immediately after the tribulation the sun is dark and and so on and then verse 30 of matthew 24 says and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and again what did what did christ say about outward visible signs an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and no sign will be given it but the sign of the prophet jonas and the sign that god allows in in order to understand the sign of jonah you have to read the bible you have to go to the book of jonah and and read about jonah then you can understand the sign of Jonah. And it, it, it's a sign found in the Bible, not in the sky, not out in the world. And it's the same thing with the sign of the Son of Man. When God ended the Great Tribulation and removed the gospel lights, and he told us about this, we had expectation that May 21, 2011, for years in advance, would be the end of salvation. We thought the unsaved would live on the earth for five months afterwards with a physical sun, physical moon, and physical stars still in the heavens above. We knew in advance the language of Matthew 24 referring to the sun, moon, and stars was speaking of the taking away of the gospel and we were incorrect about two things that the believers wouldn't be on the earth at that time because here we are and and the duration of judgment day we didn't understand the five months is a figure of uh, time to represent the complete duration of judgment day where the total period of judgment which which may be 1,600 days, just like God speaks of seven months to represent the duration of the Great Tribulation, which turned out to be an actual 23 years. And then when you put seven months and five months together, you have one year of judgment, the year of vengeance, seven months typifying the judgment on the church, five months typifying the judgment on the world. Well, now we have understanding of that, and we see the sign, the removal of the gospel, the end of salvation is a huge sign to us. What's it a sign of? Well, it's a sign of the Son of Man, but remember how uh, Matthew 24 uh, basically began in verse 3 with the disciples privately asking Jesus, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And this is really, he's Jesus has talked about the uh, falling away in the church, false Christ, false prophets. But now the very same word, sign is being used it, and it, and so he's answering the disciples question the sign of his coming and the sign of the end of the world is when you can look up into the heaven and see blackness darkness when there is no light of the gospel in Luke 21 in Luke 21, uh, it says in verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Notice it doesn't say the sun is darkened or the moon not giving its light or stars falling. It, it gets to the point that Matthew 24, 30 was raising, and, and this confirms the sign of of the Son of Man in the heaven has to do with the darkened sun, moon, and falling stars. And 
And that means right now that as we understand, as we see from the Bible, the end of salvation and that the whole earth is dark spiritually. It is uh, about a big a sign as anybody could ever ask for. It's the only kind of sign that God permits from the Bible. It is a huge indicator of the end of the world. That is, yes, we have gone through the Great Tribulation. Yes, you, you do now spiritually understand, you see with eyes of faith that the gospel light is out all over the earth. Well, therefore, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth near. And, and so it, it's really telling us we, in understanding these things, just like we understand the abomination of desolation, when you see that, okay, now when you see the dark sky, the dark heaven above, that, that's the sign of the end, and it means that it's a very little while, a very short time before it happens. So in Acts 1.11, that is just a symbolical language also, not necessarily a physical description. Of Acts, the, um, 1, in Acts 11, 1, 11. Uh, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now Jesus went up into heaven how many days after his resurrection? Forty days. Forty days he appeared on earth. There was the major event of the resurrection, and then forty days, and then he went up. God brought to pass the major event of the end of the Great Tribulation, the beginning of Judgment Day, the completion of his salvation program, the deposing of Satan, the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get much more major than all those things happening on the very same day. And 40 times 40 days later, as God is emphasizing uh, in, a, in a big way, the testing of his people, we will be lifted up just as Christ was lifted up in in that 40-day period after he rose from the dead on Sunday morning. So, yes, they they physically saw him go, and, uh, well, we'll, we'll see Christ. That uh, The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 that the dead, the resurrected uh, dead, will rise first, and then we will rise to be, to meet the Lord in the air and and to be with him. So um, at, at that point, we will uh, be like him. We will have uh, new resurrected bodies that are, that are uh, like his. And, and so there will be no problem. There will be no sin uh, within us to prevent us from seeing him. Uh, we, we, would, we would then enter into the new heaven and new earth. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Chris. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you for raising those verses and for your question. Now let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Um, my question is regarding the study today. I think in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, there's also, you know, a referencing that the just shall live by faith. And we had just gone through chapter 1 where... God's talking about the violation, you know, violence is done to the law, that there's no judgment going forward, and that he's going to raise the Chaldeans up in chapter 6, mm -hmm. and then um, he's raising them for judgment and correction, and then chapter 2 starts out with um, Habakkuk going to see what the Lord will tell him upon the watch, and then he tells him to write it, So there we, and, then chap and then verse 4 happens, and I just wanted you to comment on it, because it's just out of nowhere, you know, the just shall live by faith. Yes. Yes, Thank well, that, that, that's um, um, good that you mentioned that. I thought about mentioning it during the study, 
and notice um, it speaks of writing the vision, making it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it in verse 2. And to run in the Bible means to obediently follow. As um, I think in Psalm 119, it says, I will run the way of thy commandments. And, and so we go after the commandments. We follow the commandments of God. Now, God is, is saying, write the vision, make it plain upon tables. And this would be more like the tables of the Ten Commandments that the Word of God was written upon. Make it plain. When does God make his writing plain? And the answer is at the time of the end. Seal up the word, God said to Daniel, till the time of the end, and then knowledge will increase. So it's at the time of the end that the word is written on tables, and it's made plain that we may obey it, that readeth it, because now we can understand it. And then it says in verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. And, and um, in verse 3, we need to substitute the pronoun it and make it masculine. Every place you read it, because it's referring to God, the Holy Spirit, and, of course, God is um, masculine. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end he shall speak and not lie. Though he tarry, wait for him, because he will surely come. He will not tarry. And then we can see plain as day. God just made it plain upon tables. It's referring to our present time, our present situation, this scenario of a spiritual judgment is the only thing that makes any sense insofar as what God just said in verse 3. When he says that you, you must wait, um, it, it's going to happen, wait for him because he will surely come he will not tarry and then in hebrews hebrews 10 that quotes from habakkuk it says in verse 37 for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry um oh in uh, habakkuk 2 3 says though it he tarry wait for him because he will surely come he will not tarry so on one hand, he will tarry. On the other hand, he will not tarry. Now, the only solution to that puzzle is that Christ came in judgment on the very day he said he would, May 21, 2011, shut the door of heaven, and, and therefore he did not tarry in bringing judgment on the world. He did it, yet... Here we are still, as it's a, a prolonged period of judgment, and it's a spiritual judgment, it's as though he did tarry. So, although he tarry, he will not tarry. This present situation is the only solution to the dilemma that that language presents, and and we read and we fully understand, of course, that's what God means. And uh, then when he comes on the last day, if we're correct, the 1600th day, the 10,000th day, the last day of Tabernacles, October 7th, 2015, then he will destroy everything. And uh, th that tearing for the final destruction will be over. But then, in this context of opening up the scriptures at the time of the end, of tearing but not tearing, we read in verse 4, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And why does God make that statement in this context? And in Hebrews 10, um, that I read one verse from earlier, if we go there, 
it, it's here too. But there's a little bit more added. It, it, let me read from verse 35 of Hebrews 10. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. And God's people did the will of God in warning the world and finishing the evangelization program of God. That work is complete. So we've done the will of God in that regard. And afterwards, there is a need, a necessity of patience, because uh, patience has to do with being tried. As it says in James 1, um, in verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And, and so, after we've done the will of God in getting the gospel to the world, and God used that to save the last of his elect, you have a need of patience, that is, you will be tried, and that trial will develop patience, which will be necessary to endure to the end. And of course, it all revolves around whether or not we're truly saved. And then it says in verse 37, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now notice here um, the personal pronoun in Hebrews 10.37 is correct. It, it doesn't say it as it does in Habakkuk. So we, we have the biblical justification for making that substitution. He that shall come will come and will not tarry. And all right, we understand that now, how that works. But then in verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Well, you, you know, as we read verses 38 and 39, you would almost think that God knew in advance as he wrote this exactly what would take place in our present time. That people who were involved in having done the will of God would, would fail at patience. They would lack patience at the trying of their faith and that affliction. They, they begin to draw back. They don't they don't endure. They don't wait upon God. And when, when the Lord Jesus gives the appearance of tarrying, although he did not tarry, and, and that is there's a spiritual judgment day, those that were involved and in having done the will of God uh, insofar as evangelizing the world, they're, they're severely tested and only the just, the ones made righteous by Christ and his righteousness and by his faith, the, the truly saved will continue. The rest, they will not continue, but they will draw back. And, and again, uh, we've witnessed many that have failed in this and have gone back. They've gone back to church. And someone told me um, recently that he went back to church soon after May 21, 2011, because his wife wanted to go back to church. And, and it, it, it's a sorrowful thing. It's a tragic thing. And, of course, a true believer would never want to go back to church. Why would anyone want to go back there? Well, my my wife or my family want to return to church and and so uh, what what is the desire of a true believer is it to please his wife or is it to please god and it's always to please god and yes we please our wife in in all things lawful and that pleases god that we seek to please our wife but if our wife wants something contrary to the law of God, then, of course, we don't seek to please our wife. We have to first please God. 
and say, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try to do something else, whatever else I can do, but I can't go back to church. You know, God has said that we're not to go back into the house and, and uh, remember Lot's wife. Uh, she looked back, and, and that's exactly what is happening. We're seeing a lot of people that spiritually are patterned after Lot's wife. That they're turning into a pillar of salt because God's judgment is upon them as they turn back to the church or turn back to the world, and and now uh, they're they're involved in uh, parties or they're involved in social things. They're in, they're involved in politics and changing America. Now they're they're involved in all sorts of other activities that the world is involved in and and very little if any involvement in the gospel in the word of god that where did that go well they've drawn back or they've gone back to former doctrine and and this is very typical of many because they they reject May 21, 2011, Judgment Day, and they know that's based upon the biblical calendar of history, so they must reject the calendar, which leads to other problems. The calendar is very helpful as far as helping us to see the abomination of desolation and to know the proper times and seasons for the judgment on the church and the judgment on the world and so forth. And when you lose sight of the calendar, you begin to lose sight of the judgment on the church. And now you have more people open and, and willing to think, well, yeah, there's true believers in the church, and we can't make those kind of calls. We, we can't say that, that none of the elect are in the church, and they're, they're going back to former doctrines. One big former doctrine is no man knows the day or hour. Many have gone back to that, which, uh, which leads to other errors, which causes people to put their fingers in their ears and to no longer listen to um, information regarding times and seasons. Uh, it, it is happening before our eyes, what God is warning of here, but... But here, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In the Great Tribulation, there was a great trial of faith. And through trial, you develop patience. And in Judgment Day, a great trial of faith. And the judgment of God is done by faith or, or understood by faith. That God performs the judgment. We see the judgment by faith. We understand these things by faith. And through faith, the, the fig tree is cursed and the mountain is cast into the sea. But thank you for that verse. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Could you please read Luke twelve twenty eight and Malachi 4, 1? Luke twelve twenty eight says, If then God so clothes the grass which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And then Malachi 4, verse 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith Jehovah of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Um, is God linking tomorrow with judgment of the unsaved of the world being cast into the oven, as Malachi is relating the day that the earth shall burn as an oven? Oh, that's a very good question. Because in Luke 12, 28, if then God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, 
it, it's speaking of two days. There's today and there's the next day, tomorrow. And uh, we, we understand there was a day of salvation, a prolonged day of salvation that extended for centuries. And now there is the day of judgment. And it, it, it is, um, yeah, a very good possibility that maybe that is what's being referred to. Uh, uh, today, the grass is in the field. Today is the day of salvation. But the day to come, tomorrow, when, when this day ends and, the, and God's salvation is complete, then comes judgment day. So um, I think there's a, a good possibility of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing those verses. And let's go to the next person. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Um, I was wondering, could you read Revelation 8.8? 8? Revelation 8? I think uh, it Verse just uh, is another piece. And I'm not sure if you mentioned it in tonight's study. No, I didn't. And then I, okay. And, and let, let me read it. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And, and this is referring to the judgment on the churches because that's the focus of Revelation 8 in verse after verse after verse. And God does refer to the church as a mountain because the church represented the kingdom of God. It was the outward representation of the kingdom of God to the people of the, of the earth. Um, for instance, in, um, I think it's Amos, Amos chapter 6, it says in verse 1, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. And, and there God is referring to Israel. Um, Samaria would be the ten tribes in the north. And, and he calls it the mountain of Samaria. And, and so we can carry that picture over because Israel typifies the church. So when God brought judgment on the churches, the uh, mountain was cast into the sea. Now, this is not what was being referred to in Matthew's parable because it was the cursing of the fig tree that Christ said we would do, they're the typified the judgment on the church. And God is able to use many pictures and, and illustrations of judging the church. And, and you can read Revelation 8 to find many more. And so um, the cursing of the fig tree there represents the judgment on the church. The casting of the mountain into the sea, the judgment of Babylon, or representing this world because it's the two-stage, two-part uh, final judgment. And, and I guess what we could learn from Revelation 8.8 8 is that it's the same cup of wrath. God pictures the judgment on the church as, as a mountain cast into the sea. God pictures the judgment of Babylon, the world, as a mountain cast into the sea. So this is evidence that... Um, being a mountain cast into the sea indicates the wrath of God is upon you. Okay, very well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for bringing up this verse. And let's go to our last caller tonight. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good evening, Chris. Can you go to Judges 14, 12, and verse 18? Judges 14, 12. I don't know wow. if we'll have time to read all that. Um, what, what's your question? Oh, okay, because I was just wondering, Samson made a bet with some men that they could not answer the riddle within the period of seven days. In verse 18, the riddle was answered within the seven-day period, and the men of the city 
said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down. They answered the riddle before the sun went down. And my question is, why was the phrase before the sun went down used? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. But the riddle, Samson would be a type of Christ, of course, uh, putting forth a riddle. That's what Jesus did every, every time he said the kingdom of heaven is like and then spoken parables. Parables are riddles. I, I think the word riddle might be translated as parable somewhere, but don't hold me to that. Um, uh, I'll try to check that out later. But it definitely, whether it's translated as parable, it, it definitely is a picture of a parable. And, and so Christ is speaking parables to these people who, uh, it's the marriage feast. And, and remember how God pictures the sending forth of the gospel as calling people to a marriage feast. And so um, the seven days of the feast would more than likely represent the time that was allotted before um, the marriage was to take place or, or the consummation of the marriage, which would point to the end of the world or judgment day. And we do know there were 7,000 um, or seven days. God said to Noah, yet seven days. And that's related to 7,000 years of time that really God gave the people of the world to solve the riddle. Because it, in one sense, if you're able to understand parables, well, um, uh, what is what does Christ say? I think in Matthew thirteen um, that they might not understand and be converted. If you lack understanding, that that ties in with not being converted. And if you possess understanding, that relates, therefore, to conversion or salvation. Now I haven't gone through this whole thing as far as who those people represent. Um, and especially the wife revealing the riddle, I, I'm not sure about that, but I think we can just see the basic elements there as it relates to the gospel uh, call. Do you think it could be uh, part of the resurrection? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, but okay. we, we've come to the end of our time tonight. Thank you for calling and sharing this passage, and I would like to thank everyone for being with us tonight and especially for the Bible verses that you raised and we had an opportunity to read and consider. But we have come to the end of our time. Please uh, join us again, Lord willing, this coming Sunday afternoon during our online fellowship. But at this point, I'll say good night and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these questions and answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.